alone is worthy praising. Sing a song of jubilee and let the song be on a baking. Sing we now to honor him, Lord, his triumph over sin. Let us sing redemption song, let it last the whole day long. his wonderful works. Hallelujahs we will sing and the mountains echoing his praises in heaven and on the
song we're about to sing, which is Oceans, which I'm sure you have all heard before. We've sung it many times. But I, I felt called to share some, um, some insight into what the song talks about, what the words mean. Um, and I just found this online. I thought it was, it was really powerful. So um, the song Oceans is a beautiful reminder of the power of faith and the strength of God's love. The lyrics speak of God's call, call to us to step out into the unknown, trusting in him even when our feet may fail. This is a powerful reminder of the faith we are called to have in God, even when the waters seem deep and the waves seem high. Our church has gone through that right uh, the last few months. Uh, the waves have seen very high. It seems like we've been in a storm. Um, but the Bible speaks of the same, this same faith in many places. Uh, most notably in Matthew 14, uh, t- verses 22 through 33, Jesus calls Peter to step out of the boat and walk on the water. Peter does so, but when he takes his eye off of Jesus and looks at the waves, as we've all heard, in the stories of the Bible, he begins to sink. This story is a reminder that when we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on the waves, our faith faith will always falter. Um, The song Oceans also speaks of God's grace that abounds in the deepest waters. This is a reminder of the grace that God gives us, even in the midst of our deepest struggles. Romans 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This verse reminds us that God's grace is available to us even in our darkest moments. Finally, this song speaks of trusting in God without borders. This is a reminder that we can trust in God no matter what the circumstances may be. In Isaiah uh, chapter 26, verse 3, um, it says, You will keep in perfect peace. Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. This verse reminds us that when we trust in God, he will keep us in perfect peace. This song, Oceans, is a powerful reminder of the faith that we are called to have in God. When we trust in him, he will lead us through the deepest waters and give us the strength to keep our eyes above the waves. So I just thought that was really, really powerful. And when we sing this next song in a second, think about that. Think about how you can have faith. You can trust in God. As Dr. Edwards talked about just two weeks ago, I know we have been trusting God through this entire process, and we're we're looking forward to um, July 7th. This week is Kids Week, and we thought that it would be no other way to bring it in than have one of our very own children uh, at our church Come up here and sing Oceans with us. So I'm going to invite uh, Liliana Craddock to come up here, and she's going to sing with us. Please stand with us.
to remind you that a few weeks ago, just pretty recently, I shared a sermon with you talking about God always leads his people. Now that is a fact, and we are experiencing that fact even with Pastor Patrick coming here in two weeks to be the pastor of King's Grand Baptist Church. He has led us, led our pastor search committee, led our congregation to welcome this man with unanimous approval. I just think that is amazing and wonderful. And so we must always realize that God leads his people. Now, Leads his people means you individually, me individually. Leads his people means you and your families. Leads his people means the family of this good church. God always leads his people. And last week, we experienced and celebrated the goodness of God. And I want to kind of reflect back on that and our sharing, my sharing with you here in the next few minutes hopefully is going to continue to amplify the wonderful things that God leads us in. And so I want to go back and read the words of that powerful song. I hope you've heard it. You should if you listen to any Christian music. It is just absolutely played over and over and over, and I am thrilled about that. I sat with one of our church leaders here at lunch a few weeks ago, and he celebrated this song, The Goodness of God, and he said, and here's this big six-foot-three man, fine leader in our community, and he said, every time I hear that song, I just weep. Now, the weeping is a weeping of meaning and love and excitement and thrill that God is so good. So please just listen to these words again. Because it says, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, and I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful, and all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath, I am able, and I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment. I hate for words like that, and sometimes I am so busy, I just rush on by stuff. And so do you. And I hate for us to miss any of those words, because all my life, God, you have been faithful. You have led me through the fire. You have led me in life. You've given me decisions. You've given me love. You've given me freedom. You've given me forgiveness. All my life, he has been faithful. And therefore, I am going to sing of the goodness of God. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment because I'm going to share two or three verses that I've shared with you before because I love these verses and they fit perfectly with this whole sense of continuing to seek and follow the goodness of God, the leadership of God. And then we're going to move to some very brand new verses that I've discovered in the book of Isaiah. But please remember that I say to you often that the verse in Matthew 6, what does it say? Seek. First, the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and he will take care of all of what you need. Now, what does that mean? It means that you put Jesus Christ first. 
That was Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, if you'll seek me first in all of the ways that I teach you, then I'll take care of what you need. Now, yes, that's a wonderful statement of provision and all the necessities of life. But it's more than that. (laughs) Jesus Christ, Almighty God, is saying to you and me, if we will put him first, then we will find the way. We will know the way. And we can follow his leadership. And then I remind you of the verse in the second verse in Romans 12. What does it say? Do you remember? It says, do not be conformed. Do not follow. Do not be conformed to the ways of this world. But be transformed. That means be changed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then there is a a wonderful reward for that. The second verse in Romans 12 says, when you are conformed and transformed by the renewing of your mind with Jesus Christ, then you will be able to know his will, what is good and perfect. Now, do you you get that? (laughs) Leadership of Almighty God for you and your life as a Christian man or woman, as a Christian family, this church is a fine Christian church. If we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind, our spirits, our behavior, all of what he will lead us in, then we will know what his will is. And then I realize, and I hope you do, this whole thing of renewing. How do you get to be new? The fact is, is that in our natural state, in our old state, I hate to say this, but it's true, we're not much good. (laughs) The Bible tells us we're sinful, we're selfish, we make mistakes, we have our own motives, we have our own preferences. And so in our natural state, we have a lot of struggles and a lot of flaws. I do, you do. However... To be new means to be changed in the presence and through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. It says, everyone that is in Christ Jesus, that has Christ Jesus in them, is what? A new creation. Now just let that sink in for a moment. I don't want to live in my flaws. Well, maybe sometimes I do. I'm sorry, that's honest. But according to God's plan, I don't want to and I don't need to and you don't either. And it says that if we're in Christ Jesus and we allow him to be in us, then we are a new creation. The old order has gone away. And everything has become new in you and me. So do you want to be new? That's just the question. Now, I want you to think with me about these verses. I'm going to look right now at the 57th chapter of Isaiah. We're going to look on the screen at another Isaiah passage in a moment. But in Isaiah 57, and these two chapters, these two verses or sections are things that just in my own study that I came across recently, And seriously, when I read them, I just stopped and I said, these have got to be said. I thank you, Lord, because I'm just going to preach something on it. I'm going to try to share what you're saying to us. Still thinking about following God's leadership and the fact that he will lead us always. Isaiah 57, verse 11 and 12. It starts out, and I love this, because that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're talking about. It starts off, it says, the Lord will guide you always. Now let that sink in, please. The Lord will guide you always. I'm not saying that. I didn't make this up. That is what the scripture says. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. 
And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. He will satisfy your, your needs in the midst of this terrible, cruddy world. That's what sun-scorched land means. And it is a real difficult place. And through the Lord and his goodness and his leadership, this is saying he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. And will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. My wife, God bless her, she loves to play in the dirt. She does. We were about to go to bed last night, fairly early, because we like getting up on early, early yeah, on Sunday morning. And we're sitting there about to get up and go upstairs. And she said, i got to go outside and water my tomatoes. And she did. And God bless her, she loves playing in the dirt. But... This is saying that with God's leadership, you and I will be like well-watered gardens, like a spring whose water never fails. You and your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Now that's verse 12 of Isaiah 7. You, you and your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, will raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repair of broken walls and restore of streets and dwellings. You know who I think about when I read that? Nehemiah. Now we've talked about Nehemiah right here. One of my favorite people in the Old Testament. This young man left the pagan land and came to Jerusalem for what? To rebuild the broken walls. They had been in ruins and rubble for years. And in 52 days, Nehemiah and hundreds of people in Jerusalem rebuilt those walls. Why and how? Through the leadership of Almighty God. God always leads his people. Always. And you and I are definitely his people. Now, I'm going to reach in my pocket here, and I'm going to pull out a little piece that I had to holler at Scott a minute ago and get him to give it to me, because he's about to walk to the back with this right here. And we're going to look at the 35th chapter of, as soon as I get this on, we're going to look at the 35th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 10. I want to just share this beautiful chapter from God's Word with you in regard to what God can do when we obey and submit and surrender to His leadership. It says in verse 1, The desert and the parched land will be glad. Now, I'm going to stop right there because I want to identify with and I want you to identify with the fact that we are represented in that first statement. I said a moment ago that in our naturalness, in the ways that we want to do it and the ways that we do do it sometimes, we are sun-parched land. We are flawed. We are sinful, flawed creatures. Well, this is saying right here to start, the desert and the parched land will be glad. Ah, there's hope in that. Now, I have said to you before, and I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I'm thankful that when I was nine years old, I accepted Christ into my life. And from the time I was nine till I was 17, I was leading others and I was following God's leadership and I was a teenager seeking to be a decent young man in and through Jesus Christ. At 17, I went absolutely crazy. I did. I call it my brain dead period. It was dead. 
from the time I was 17 till the time I was 23, I lived a completely different life. I'll illustrate it by saying what I say often. If my wife and my two beautiful daughters had known me when I was 20 years old, they would not have even talked to me. They would have gone by on the other side of the street. That was just, unfortunately, the kind of character I was in my university life and all the partying and all the fraternity stuff. I was a part of the desert's parched land. That was me. But when I was 23, and after the Lord dealing with me and leading me and putting godly people into my life, one Wednesday morning I fell on my knees beside my bed in the fraternity house and I said, Lord, please forgive me. I have made an absolute mess out of my life. And right then, he forgave me. And I want to tell you, he never left me during those six years, even though I was a mess. But when I prayed and he forgave me right there on my knees beside my bed, then this parched person, this desert wasteland of a man, 23 years old, I was glad. It says the desert and parched land will be glad. Why? Because now I was forgiven. I was free. And I will tell you, thank the Lord, and this is his work in my life. I pulled a pack of cigarettes out of my pocket, threw them in the trash can. I smoked two packs a day. I was drunk the night before, last time I've been drunk. And that night, I resigned from the fraternity. Not only that, but I was the president of the fraternity. Forty guys. They went nuts. They thought I was nuts. And they asked me, what are you doing, Don? I told them that I was coming back to the Lord. I was coming back to being free and glad in his love and in his forgiveness. Maybe you've been that same road. I hope not because I don't, I'm not proud of those six years at all. But what I am thankful for is, is that he has been faithful to me. Even when I was in junk. And thank the Lord, 23 years old, and he has blessed me for these uh, maybe 20 or 30 years. A lot more than that, though. So, the desert and the parched land will be glad. Because of what? Because of Jesus Christ in life. It goes on with some agricultural, with some uh, garden kind of analogies. It says, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom like crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. And why will they see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God? Because he is always faithful. He is leading even the people here, the people here, the people, the person here in his goodness. And he will lead us. But you know what we got to do? We got to join him. We got to follow. He is a good God. Absolutely. And he has the plan. But he needs real Importantly, he needs your cooperation and my cooperation. He's not going to take a baseball bat and beat you over the head with it. He is going to, to convict. He's going to teach. He's going to love. He's going to forgive. He's going to motivate you. Yes, he will do his work. But he needs you and I to cooperate. And then we will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of Almighty God. The next section, now he speaks, God's word speaks to you as a godly person because there are people around you and me. 
that are flawed and are struggling and are dying and are lost in all of the struggles of life. And this next section of Isaiah 35 says, Strengthen the feeble hands. Now, notice how it's changed. First part is he's speaking to those of us that are desert and parched and the fact that we will be glad because of the presence of the Lord. Now he's saying because of the presence of the Lord, you've got to reach out to other people because other people need. This is leadership from Almighty God because I've said to you many times in the last two years that your life does not belong to you. My life does not belong to me. It is very important for us to reach out and give ourselves to other people, to love them and to tell them about the best love in the world, and that is the love of, of Jesus Christ. So it says, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. There are people around us that cannot stand. Now I want you to think about that. This is spiritually, this is emotionally, this is relationally. This is a call to ministry. This is a call to live in Christ's love in front of and in the midst of other people. Steady the knees that give way. These people cannot stand. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Now think about that for a moment. Do you understand that's a call for you and I? to participate in some of the work of Almighty God because what do the angels always say when they come to encounter people? Do not be afraid. What did Jesus say in John 14, 27 that I've said to you a thousand times? He's going to give us a gift and with his gift of peace, we do not have to be afraid. This is saying, say to those, Speak it to those with fearful heart. Be strong and do not fear. Be courageous. That's what he said to Joshua in the first chapter of Joshua. God says that over and over and over. This is an opportunity for you and me to say that. Be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. To save you from what? Just list them out. What do you need saving from? What do I need saving from? The horrors of this world. The struggles of life. Yes, they are very real. Every one of us in here struggles. And this is saying that if you follow God's leadership, He's going to come with power. He's going to come with might, and he is going to save you from those struggles. You can be free. You can be victorious. I'm so sorry. I've spent the last 50 years counseling Christians who are defeated. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. They are defeated by life. They're defeated by their mistakes. They're defeated by others. They're defeated by struggles. They're not victorious. Some of you are not. I have not been in certain parts of my life. And this is what God wants to save us from. Let's go on. Then we come to miracles. Because of following the leadership of Almighty God, there is power in our life. It says, then will the eyes, then, then, what is that tied to? When we follow, when we know that God is going to save us, when we go back to what he's doing in our lives and in the lives of those around us, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Think about that. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap and run, and the mute will be able to declare the praises of the Lord. Please think about that. These are not my words. 
These are God's words right here on the screen in front of us from God's book, the Bible. Now, I, every time I think about the eyes of the blind will be open, I think about the wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace. Just think about it. Bartimaeus sitting by the, the roadside. This blind beggar. He calls out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, please, please stop. Have mercy on me. They told Bartimaeus, hush, leave Jesus alone. He's busy. He's going to, to Jerusalem. This is a week, one week before the Passion Week when Jesus was going to the cross. Bartimaeus sitting there yelling, blind, blind from birth, cannot see. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus walked up to him in the, one of the greatest statements in Scripture. Jesus said, Sir, what do you want me to do for you? That's one of the greatest statements in Scripture. What do you want me to do for you? This is Almighty God speaking to this old, dirty, blind beggar Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? He says, Sir, I just want to see. I don't want to be blind anymore. And it's almost anti anticlimactic. What does Jesus say? You got it. <laughs> you can see. And Bartimaeus could see. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. I absolutely love that phrase right there. And I'm going to tell you why. Because a good friend of mine years ago put it in a book that he gave me. Now, I've told you about this friend. His name's Ray Thomas. And he is set right here in this. Now, I knew him in Pennsylvania. He didn't know I'd been in Virginia Beach. And I didn't know he had been in Virginia Beach. But we became good friends in Pennsylvania. And he's been in Virginia Beach and worshiped in King's Grant. Baptist Church, and he put the verses about streams in the desert. Think about it. The desert is a wasteland. The de desert is hot. It is going to kill you. And yet through Jesus Christ, there are streams. The burning sand will become a pool. I don't know if you go to the beach very often, but if you went to the beach this afternoon at about 4 o'clock, and walked across the sand, barefooted. Uh, yeah, you can moan and groan. The burning sand will become a pool. That's what the refreshment of the Lord gives. The thirsty ground will be like a bubbling spring in the haunts where the jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. In other words, even the land will flourish as well as the blind will see. Why? Because of the freedom, the leadership, the newness that Almighty God gives to you and me. And then, and I want to tell you before we go into this section, that this section is not politically correct. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is not politically correct because it says that and a highway will be there. Out there in the desert, there will be a way made for whom? It will be called the way of holiness. I call it the holy highway. And yeah, that reflects back to a song that some of you know. But the holy highway, will be that's what it will be called. The unclean will not journey on it. What does that mean? Now, they can be clean always. God loves everybody, even in their dirtiness. But the only way they can be clean, the only way you and I can be clean, the only way I could have been clean when I was 23 years old was to completely seek the Lord and give up a bunch of junk in my life. This says the unclean will not journey on the holy highway. Wicked fools will not go about on it. It will be for those who walk on that way. What is that saying? It will be this holy highway 
That's why I say it's not politically correct, because it's not, well, anybody that wants to can come walk on our road. No. This is for believers. Those of us, and I trust that every person in here can walk on the holy highway, that you believe, that you live in a part of the way, the truth of Almighty God. It will be for those who walk on the way. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Only the redeemed. That is you and me. Thank the Lord. Not, not on anything I've done, not on anything you've done. It's on what he has done. And we have the privilege of walking on the holy highway. If, when, we sacrifice and surrender and submit to the leadership of Almighty God, that's what we do. And then the end of this beautiful, powerful chapter, Isaiah 35, please go read it sometime this afternoon. Study it in your own time. It says, and the ransom of the Lord will return. <coughs> when and how, but when Jesus Christ comes back, then we're going to return. And it says, they will enter Zion with singing. Where is Zion? It's in that war-torn territory of Israel. Jerusalem. They will enter Zion with singing everlasting joy will crown their heads. Do you understand when Jesus Christ comes back, all of this cruddy stuff will be gone. All of the struggles will be gone. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Do you ever sometimes just look at life and say, oh, <laughs> I just don't know if I can do it. Yes. Yeah. It's a tough trip sometimes. And it is very tough for anybody that tries to do it all by themselves. And you and I do not have to do it by ourselves unless you and I are stubborn enough to try to do it by ourselves. And yeah, I'm stubborn, you're stubborn, part of being selfish. But here's the statement. We follow the leadership of the Lord and we don't have to do it by ourselves. Now to finish our thoughts a moment, I'm going to read this passage from Revelation 21. You know it, but listen carefully because it says after this restoring and after Jesus comes back, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and women, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has now passed away. Do you understand that when we follow the leadership of the Lord, this is our everlasting hope. No more pain, no more tears, no more death because of the wonderful love of the God that we declare is so, so good. Let's pray, please.